Lord's house in the middle of the week, and I hope you're doing well. And we have missionary evangelist Carlos Chacon with us, and we're glad about that. And he drove through a lot of snow today, and he came from Elgin, Illinois, and that's kind of where the storm was. So we were talking, and he said, I'm leaving, I'm coming, see how far I can get. And I look at the weather report and call him a couple hours later and, hey, how you doing? Is it still, I'm still going, I'm still going. But he saw a lot of snow, but I'm glad he was willing to come, aren't you? Yeah. And we're glad he is here, looking for a great evening uh, together. Let's sing just a little bit. 219, little as much when God is in it. 219, let's stand. Brother Benjamin, please come lead us. Oh, 
seated. I'd like the girls to be ready to come now and sing a song for the Lord. And they're going to sing a song entitled, I Found It All. And when we found the Lord Jesus Christ, we, we did, didn't we? We found he who is everything. And so the girls are going to sing. Then I'll introduce Brother Carlos, and he'll have about a four-minute video, and then we'll move on from there. yourself to us and then we're going to have a have your video we're so glad we're so glad you're here say a word and then fellas we'll get ready for the lights and then we'll have this have this video thank you pastor thank you so much church it's a blessing to be here my name is carlos chacon and i come from elgin illinois from the northwest bible baptist church god has called us to preach the gospel to the spanish-speaking world so i'm an evangelist i am a missionary evangelist and have been for 20 years mostly in the country of mexico and from there, we travel abroad. I have, I have been in 11 different countries. A lot of this is uh, preaching in tent ministry. I have a 1,000-seat tent. In fact, I have two of them, so I keep one in Mexico, and I keep the other one in, in the United States. Right now, this particular presentation is about our new project for the country of Venezuela, and this is very unique. There are no American missionaries allowed at this time, not one, absolutely zero. They're, they're, they're not allowed. They're not having their visas approved at this time because of the socialist dictatorship and so forth i enter the country with a mexican identity and so that is how that is how uh, god has led me to do this i have been to venezuela twice now we are we are doing large-scale open-air outdoor evangelistic meetings i was in in december in venezuela and that meeting had an attendance of 4,300 people the the video that you'll see was actually my first trip and we started out we had some meetings about 1,600 people, another one had 1,300 people, so just different crowds, different meetings, 
and God is opening a door. It's a, it's a mission field that is ripe for the harvest and no labor. So we'll be talking about that some more. Thank you so much. Chacon, missionary evangelist in the Spanish-speaking world. My sending church is Northwest Bible Baptist Church of Elgin, Illinois. I want to take a moment to talk to you about my Venezuela project. I am now targeting the country of Venezuela, where American citizens are having great difficulty entering the country because of the economic collapse, the inflation, the socialism, the starvation and hunger, and all of these things have brought about a crisis in the country but God has given me an open door. As a Mexican citizen, I am able to enter Venezuela without a need to have a visa. Through large scale, outdoor, open air gospel crusades, we are now preaching the gospel to multitudes of people. Hundreds and thousands of people can be reached with the gospel through this ministry. Today we are in a village and I put on a soccer tournament and I feed the kids so that we can preach the gospel to them. Remember, the kingdom of heaven is like a net. Jesus told us to be fishers of men and the Bible talks about us being soul winners and fishers of men. So I have a theme for my ministry. I call it like a net gospel crusades because the kingdom of heaven is like a net. So I invite you to partner with me. We need your help. We need love offerings. We need support to be able to go and sponsor these meetings. My strategy is to partner with the nationals to support and finance their efforts, to come alongside and lead them in evangelism and missions and soul winning, not only outreach, but also training in the churches, training workers and soul winners in the churches to leave a lasting effect in that country. A time where American missionaries cannot enter the country. So we must partner with the nationals and we must help them. So I invite you to partner with me that we might together work in a team effort, in a partnership to help reach people in Venezuela. I plan on targeting my next trip will be to the Amazon region to minister and preach to the tribal groups. The Venezuelan national pastors want to take me to the Amazon region to preach to the tribal groups, the indigenous tribal groups by preaching by an interpreter. So I need your help for this next upcoming trip. Venezuela is not the only country that I go to. I also preach in Mexico and other countries. This is a place where we need to cast the net to catch men. Jesus said to be fishers of men and the kingdom of God is like a net. A lot of people sometimes can be skeptical about large crowds and big meetings and multitudes. How can we follow up on these people? And how can we disciple these people to make sure that they end up in church? I have developed a digital system through software where I am now pre-registering our visitors who attend our evangelistic meetings through a QR scan code. People can sign up and register by their cell phones and all of their information is downloaded into our spreadsheet system. We have their name, their age, their phone number, their email, their address, and even their church background affiliation. And we know the attendance of our meetings long before the meeting. We know beforehand how many people to expect in the meeting because of the registration. When the meeting is over, I print this and give it to the pastors and the pastors are able to follow them up one by one. We can also send them emails with videos that talk about baptism, that talk about church attendance and discipleship and follow up with them through digital media, through social media. 
Jesus Christ told us to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. The Bible tells us to do the Great Commission. So I invite you to partner with me. I want to help your church reach Venezuela for Christ. Thank you. I'm a I met Brother Carlos uh, on the phone, and uh, the pastor's prayer portal that prays together every morning. I think he was a guest of maybe Brother Jim Green one morning, and he just said, take your time and give us an update what's going on in Venezuela. And after I heard what's going on, I, he gave his, his phone number, and I texted him. I said, I want you to come to Michigan. I want you to come tell us what's going on. And so on Wednesday night was as soon as we could get him here. So he's here. And we're delighted about that. I've told him that we want to hear a lot. We like, we like to hear uh, what you've been doing. He told me a little bit about his testimony. I'd like you to share that. He's got some unique methods that he's doing uh, that really is working uh, very well. So I told him to take his time. We're in no hurry tonight. So, Brother Carlos, come give us, give us an update. Tell us what God has called you to do. And welcome to Black Lake Baptist. Thank you so much, Pastor. I appreciate it. What a blessing it is to be here, and I'm so glad. I'm going to ask you to turn in, in the Word of God, turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 9, and we'll look at a scripture, and we'll be talking about our ministry. I was born and raised in Chicago, Illinois area. My parents were immigrants. I come from Mexico. My mother's Mexican. And so I always grew up in Illinois in the United States as a, as a, as a Hispanic American person, and at the age of 15, I was saved. I was a bus kid. I was a teen bus kid at our church. The soul winners came to the streets. This was inner city, street gang, neighborhood, street gang culture that I, was, that I was involved in and so forth. And just in the streets. And soul winners came and reached us with the gospel. So at a young age, I started going to church by myself as a, as a teenager. And from then on, I felt God called me to preach. And my church took me in, my pastor, and, and uh, began to help me, develop me, and, and disciple me, and, and prepare me for God's calling for my life. So I, I went to Christian high school at our church and also attended Bible College, Providence Baptist College, graduated in 2001 and launched out ever since. That was the same year that I was married and my wife and I have been 20 years now serving God, preaching in the churches and in Mexico and doing tent evangelism. I, I traveled with evangelist Joe Boyd for three years and he's with the Lord now, but I, 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 I traveled with him in 1995, 1996, also in later years, in 2003, he came to Mexico with me, and we were doing tent evangelism. I, inherit, I inherited his tent. He gave me his tent, so he's with the Lord. But I have these tents and all this ministry in Mexico. I have several videos in my YouTube channel that talk about specifically. Just one talks about the tent ministry. Another talks about village missions that we've done in Mexico. Another one talks about this, this presentation. And the other one, if you want to see about the Amazon, I have a whole video just for the Amazon, which was recent. And that one, you've got to go see it. Go home tonight and see it. And it talks about the villages, the tribal villages. We preach with, by an interpreter. In a, in a two-week stretch, we preached over 6,000 people just because there's so many people. In one village, 800 people. Another one, 700 people. In the big meeting, we had 4,000 people. And just, I'm talking about people walking two days through the jungle to get to the meeting. No missionaries, no, no American uh, support right now there. So they are, they are you know, the, the word is spreading about, you know, they know that I come from the United States and, and you know, I go there with a Mexican identity and so forth, and I want you to see Matthew chapter 9. Please look at the Word of God. Matthew chapter 9, and the Bible tells us in verse 37, Matthew 9, 37, Then saith he unto his disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the labors are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest, that he will send forth labors into his harvest. So I share this with churches and talk about the harvest, reaping the harvest. Let's pray for a moment. Lord, thank you so much for this time. This, this Bible study time and missionary presentation, bless tonight, speak to our hearts, challenge us to do more here at home and abroad, and we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Reaping the harvest. The Bible talks about, the Lord said, the harvest truly is plenteous, but the labors are few. Do you know American missionaries have been in Venezuela and even the Spanish countries in Mexico over 150 years? So American missionaries have been to to South America and Central America and Mexico 
a lot of American missionaries have done pioneer work and, and, and gone there and carved it out, if you will, and trained pastors, start churches, built churches. I want you to notice something that I like to talk about for a moment here in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Please notice, notice the scripture, 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And behind my ministry presentation is, is certainly I like to back it up with scripture to, to understand it's a, it's a biblical philosophy that we embrace and so forth. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. The Bible says, verse 6, 1 Corinthians 3, 6, and we'll move quickly. The Bible says, Paul said, I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So it says, so then neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. So notice, please, the distinction. There is a distinction of how some men, God uses them to be a planter. We call that sometimes a church planter, a, a, a traditional missionary who will plant church. I have, I have been a church planter. I've started three churches Two village churches in Mexico and one, church, one Spanish independent Baptist church in Illinois. And so I'm familiar with church planting. And the Bible talks about a unique particular ministry that Paul was uh, doing also that he said, I have planted. And he said, Apollo's somebody else. He's a different kind of preacher. He said, we're, all, we're on the same page. We're working for the same purpose. But he said, he's a water. He waters the plant. So that's the Bible teaching. That's the, that's the preaching of the word of God. And that's that's, that's exhorting, that's encouraging, and that's being a blessing. That's, the, that's maybe like revival speakers and revival meetings and so forth. He said, Apollos had, had watered the plant. And he says, but these are one. So you see, they're one in purpose. They're one in spirit. They have, they have different functions, different things that they do, but they are one in, in purpose, one in the same mind and, and uh, like a team effort. Bible says, verse 8, now he that planteth, he that watereth are one. There is a teamwork. And every man shall receive his own reward. According to his own labor. So God blesses not according to the results, but he blesses according to the labor and to the faithfulness uh, uh, of, of being obedient to, to one's own calling. And so we see that here. So now Jesus said something else very similar that I, I want you to see in John chapter 4. Please look in the word of God. John chapter 4, notice Jesus said something very similar uh, in, in like manner. He says in John chapter 4, making reference to this Harvest in John chapter 4, verse 35. I want you to notice in John 4, 35, Jesus said, Say not ye there are yet four months, and then cometh harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. And he that reapeth receiveth wages, and gathereth fruit unto life eternal, that both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. Notice the distinction. He that soweth and he that reapeth. There it is again. There's a different distinction. Paul talked about one that planteth, one that watereth. Now here Jesus is saying one that soweth and one that reapeth. What I'm trying to tell you is there's different kinds of labors because there are different seasons in, in, in the field, in, the, in God's work. And so the Lord is saying, listen, but the purpose is they're going to rejoice. They're doing different things. But they're going to rejoice together because they're, they're like-minded. They're of one mind, one spirit, one purpose. Verse 37, and herein is that saying true. One soweth and another reapeth. I sent you to reap that where, wherein you bestowed no labor. Other men labored and you're entered into their labors. Now, in context, the Lord's talking to the disciples. He's saying, listen, this, they're in Samaria with the Samaritan woman. Everybody, she went and told everybody. Everybody came and believed on the Lord. And they had this big revival. The Samaritan people believed on the Lord. And they asked him to stay that. He stayed for two days, the Bible says. They believed on him. So they reap this great harvest of souls in Samaria. But the Lord is teaching a lesson to the disciples. He's saying, listen, the reason is somebody came here and sowed. And he's referring to John the Baptist in context because we know that the Bible talks about where, where he preached. It was only four miles away from this location and, and uh, nearby. And so he's saying, listen, so John the Baptist prepared the way and preached and, and so forth. And, and so he says, now... You, we reaped, we entered into their labors. So you see, in, in countries like Venezuela, American missionaries have sowed already, and many have planted already. They've watered already. Right now, it is a time for a harvest. Now, in the country of Venezuela, there is an economic, financial, socialist collapse that came with dictator Hugo Chavez in 2015, and, you know, they, they embrace socialism and, and communism and so forth, and it just collapses. And their, their money, their currency is on the floor. I'm talking about 
They, it's just not worth anything. I, I, I was there, and I said, hey, pick that up. You know, that's money. And they're like, no, you can pick it all up. It's, all of it together, put together, is not going to be worth anything. You're not going to buy a piece of bubble gum. And I was like, wow. And they got, you know, all, these, all this money on the floor and, and the garbage and all this stuff. So what, what happens, inflation and all this? It collapses. It turns everything into a black market system. That means prices go up. That means cash. No one has any cash. And if, uh, that means it's hard to get cash. And they start robbing, you know, um, do, doing extortion, robbing, uh, kidnapping, different things, stealing, this uh, corruption. So much things ha happen when that happens. It just changes and alters their, their lifestyle, their system. People quit their jobs. The government says, we'll pay you $5, uh, you know, $5 a day to work. And they say, well, you can't live like that. And so they quit their jobs. Everybody quit their jobs. It's not $5 a day. It's like, it's like $5 a month. You know, it's just an exaggerating. I'm talking about they're giving stimulus to the people. It's $2. And hundreds of people are lined up to get it because when you don't have anything, $2 will be good. You got three kids and yourself, you know, that might be about $8. You see? And people are lined up by the hundreds to get their $2 of a stimulus check or, or payment. It's a digital payment. And why? Because they got this bag. It's a flower, like for dough, you know, a flower bag like this where they, they cook something. It's not quite a bread. It's not quite a tortilla. Some, i never seen anything like it in Mexico. They cook some little waffle-looking thing. It's like a crispy bread. And they cook that, and that bag costs a dollar. And they, they, they figure they can feed a family for a week on, with that bag. So that's why they say, well, you get a couple bucks, two dollars, and you, know, you have a couple kids, you can buy several of those bags, and that's how you eat and survive. And that is their economy. A lot of people go fishing and catch fish in the Amazon. That's what they eat. They eat fish from the river. So everybody, you know, does different things to survive. People work at home, just their own trades, their own personal things. People, you know, it's just become creative and all kinds of things to survive and to work jobs on their own. I'm talking about they have human ATM machines. If you, uh, if you want money, they go outside. They got a man standing at the corner. And you say, well, I, 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 if you say, I need $100 from my bank. Then, then he'll say, well, give me a little PayPal for $140. I'll give you $100 from, uh, for you. So they do this. You know, they do this, all this digital stuff and uh, to try to get money. All black market. I do not use my cell phone there. I, don't, I do not use a debit card there. Uh, I, don't, I don't reveal my American identity as it, as it would be very controversial and, and, and so forth. And I just, so I have a Mexican passport also. And I have a Mexican identity and Mexican uh, driver's license and things like this from being in Mexico. So I use that, and, and that's how I can get in. Now, this is a, a communist situation. People have asked, what about preaching the gospel and, and outdoor meetings and stuff? This, this dictatorship perhaps is a little bit more intelligent. I mean, that's why they're still in power. They're using freedom of religion as the cover to say, look, we're not communists. We let people preach the gospel. We let churches open their doors. Missionaries welcome. Yeah, right. They're not getting visas. They're not welcome. You see? But they didn't say nothing about Mexicans. So Mexico is an ally. So I have to say, you know what? If they cannot go, even if an American missionary had, had sufficient money and can go there and buy property and build churches, he, he can't go. He can't get inside. He's not allowed and haven't been allowed and will not be soon. There are Russian troops there on Venezuela, and they're, they're just they're completely, you know, uh, just, you know, uh, with, a, with a closed door. So as a Mexican person, I'm not saying Mexico is not a, not a mission field where I need to continue. I'm flying there next week. I got to spend the month. We're going to help start a church next, next month in February in Mexico. And so uh, I travel back and forth. I go to Mexico. I go... I will go to Venezuela. How am I doing this? See, I've been in Mexico for many years, doing tent ministry, traveling, going by faith. I raised my support, which was about at the beginning of my ministry, maybe $800. I said, okay, well, that's, that's what a Mexican maybe can live, live with. So maybe I could go and just, just go there and just live by faith and just, you know, evangelists get love offerings and all this. And I, and I went there. And of course, I found myself to be very undersupported. And I found myself to be very limited, under-supported missionaries and evangelists. We do more things than, than laymen. We do more things even than pastors that are, that are national pastors. We, we travel more. We do more things. We, 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 we have to provide for us and provide for the, if we start a church and so forth. So 
you have to budget as a missionary. Of course, I didn't know any better, and I didn't do that. So I said, I just went by faith. I said, we'll have, this, will, this will be good to start with. And I, I, I said, I didn't mind working jobs, little part-time jobs and doing things. There's a time where I started a church in Illinois. It was just a two-year church plant. I returned from Mexico. It was 2007. I did a two-year church plant. I did, a, I, I did landscaping and lawn mowing, had my landscaping in, in, my, in the neighborhood and, just, and had my own business, uh, you know, do part-time and, and part-time church planning. And so, so that's what I was doing. I didn't mind working. And, you know, I, I see that in the scripture where Paul even talks about that for years and so forth. Even in recent years, I said, okay, I, I was in Mexico and I said, well, I have a skill. Uh, uh, I'm also a bilingual interpreter, a translator interpreter. I'm bilingual from birth, and I, I, t I teach English. I teach ESL English. English is a second language. And so that became a bi big market in recent years. And so I, be I became a, a, an English ESL teacher. And that was a good paying job and work from home and everything like this. And so I did that for many years. So I, I, don't, I, I don't mind doing things. And now God has put us in a time where we reached a, a, a kind of a milestone of 20 years. After so many times where we almost wanted to quit, I'm talking about, you know how many flat tires we get? I travel with heavy trailers. The tent goes on a heavy trailer. The lug nuts break. I travel with an RV. Sometimes the flat tires, lug nuts break, all of these things. I learned to carry parts. I learned to carry these, and you know, and pay mechanics to fix it and all this stuff. So the ministry has been, you know, traveling, so much traveling. I'm an itinerant traveling preacher, sometimes helping Spanish churches in the United States, preaching revivals, doing tent ministry, and all of these things. And so we're just trying to follow the Lord's leading and, and do what he has called us to do. Uh, there are other ways. Sometimes I have thought to myself, why don't I do a ministry like, like another person? Or, you know, maybe I can pastor a church or maybe I could just be a normal missionary that doesn't travel so much and all this stuff. You know, I, I, have, I have thought to myself that, but I have learned through the years that God has unique men to do unique things. And I want to do his plan for my life and follow his leading. Bible says, make full proof of thy ministry. Do the work of an evangelist. And so God has, has blessed us through the years. So now God is, has, has spoken to me in, in these recent months and said, go to Venezuela. So get, leave, leave Mexico and you, we can preach there, go in and out of Mexico, but leave that mission field and start going. Prepare, do what you need to do. And, I, you know, the first thing that comes to my mind is here we go again. All over again. I mean, we got comfortable in Mexico. We had we built our circle of friends. I mean, we we had churches that we preached to. You know, every year go back to the same churches. We had our ministry, our village ministry. We had you know we had our house in Mexico and all these things. So so God says, go and I'm moving you to to this particular country for this particular time to go to Venezuela. Well, that means go to the states. That means relocate and and readjust, restructure. And, and get busy and start start traveling. If the if the tires gets flat, fix it. You know, if, if you need something for your vehicle, get it. Get tools, get parts, but do what God wants you to do. See, the test of character is what it takes to quit. And we want to keep going. And so the Lord has, you know, in Mexico, there's drug cartels. There's uh, this happened in started in 2006. Really got bad, 2010. 2012, I mean, the Mexican president, Felipe Calderón, came here to the White House, spoke during the Obama era and talked about, talked about how you shouldn't have guns and all this stuff. When over there, we're having a massacre. More people died in Mexico than Iraq, than the Iraq war. All the years put together, just one year in Mexico. And we cross the border in Texas all the time and see all this, see the corruption, get pulled over by state troopers. They say, see, I had American plates on my vehicle. Say, so this, the Mexican state trooper they call him a federale. They, he'll, he'll pull me over and say, listen, you have to pay your tax, your toll f to us so that you can pass here. How much are you going to give us? And all this stuff. And, you know, just, just corruption, just crime. I learned to talk my way out of it. I learned to say, listen, I'm a, I'm, I'm a minister of the gospel. It's against my religion. It's against my faith and all this stuff. And, uh, and I just can't give you anything, you know. And they just say, ah, just get out of here, you know, something like that. So I learned to talk to them and talk my way out of it. And so much stuff happens. I mean, I put gas in a gas station next to the drug cartel people, which is usually a truck with men, six or seven men with guns. They're not allowed to have guns in Mexico, but they got the, the cartel guys have guns. So we're putting gas and sitting here looking at each other. I say, well, no wonder nobody's here. You know, it's by itself. We're by ourselves because the cartel's here, you know. And so you just kind of go away, drive away, you know, 
just quietly and so forth. They're real, they're real nice. If you don't do nothing to them, they don't do anything to you. You know, they only kill each other and all this stuff. You know, but but all all these things, the cartels. Listen, I was behind we're talking about. You know, I came on the radio today. I spoke on your radio in Holland, Michigan. I called in, and somebody was talking about what do you call it, Family Life Radio or something? 91, 91.7. They were talking about the border and all this stuff in Mexico. And they said, call us here. I got on the phone. I called them. And I told them who I, who I was and what I was doing here. And anyway, I told them about, I told them about half of the things I'm telling you. So anyway, uh, but I, I've seen in Mexico and I've been, I, I've seen all of this. Now, let me tell you what, what has happened. Mex the gospel's been in Mexico for over 150 years. But now it's a missionary sending country. Why? Why? What happened? You know, how come year, many years ago there was missionaries going, going in, going in, Americans going in, taking money, sending money, all this stuff. But in the last 30 years, Mexico has become a missionary. It's not a mission field now. It's a missionary sending country. There are Mexicans preaching all over the world. So how did that happen? Well, I'll tell you why. The reason is in the, the missionaries, the American missionaries of the 1980s went from here from the 1970s of America, that storefront era, that, that soul winning, that, that from a parking lot, build a church, that, that soul winning era, the bus ministry, era, all this stuff. Those missionaries went to Mexico and they said, you could do this. You, can, you could carve out a work for God. You, could, you have the same God and, and God has, the gospel has power in Spanish, just like in English and, and everything. And, and the message caught on. That we're talking about training the nationals, telling the national Mexican pastors and saying, listen, you, you, you can do this too. You don't have to just be on the receiving end. You can also do a work for God and, and, and grow your churches and train your own preacher boys and send out your own missionaries. Well, the message caught on, and that's what happened. So we see, I'm a younger generation that sees this and sees, wow, look at all these churches in Mexico. They're growing, and they're on fire for God, and look at all these missionaries going out. Well, there's other countries where we need to go and repeat this process. Do the same thing. How? By motivating the nationals. So now I go to Venezuela, and not only do we do large-scale evangelism and outdoor meetings, but I tell the pastors, I say, look, pastors, come with me. Let's do this. I'm going to help your churches. I sponsor and I finance these meetings. They, they don't have any money whatsoever to do anything. So I raise the money, and I, a couple, five or $6,000, I'll raise it in two months or so, and then I'll go and spend it over there in two or three weeks just preaching the gospel, just outdoor evangelistic meetings. But the pastors come with me and they, I don't take a team. People say, you take a missionary team? No, I go by myself alone. I, I make the churches, I train them. I use them to be the missionary team because they're the ones that are going to stay. So, I, so by following me around, doing everything I'm talking about, we take loudspeakers and we go to the marketplace and we go do this and we go put on a soccer game over here. We go over here and we gather, you know, hundreds of people to preach the gospel. And then after two and a half weeks of that, then we, have, we close out with a pastor's training conference, a couple, two days or so. And I, and I pay for that. I, I, I provide meals and food and, and so forth. And I tell them, get the pastors in here, all the preachers. But not only do they hear the, the teaching, they were with us for the two weeks that I was there. The message catches on. It, it, it's something that catches on. They see it. They hear it. They see it. And they say, that's true. That's what we need to do. Our churches have been asleep. Our churches has, 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 have been have been discouraged. It's like the Great Depression or something. And, and, but this is a perfect time to reap the harvest. Everybody's at home. Nobody's working real, you know, jobs. Everybody's at home in, in Venezuela. They're at home. They're in front of their houses. They're not doing anything. Five, over 5 million people from Venezuela have migrated outside the country. And they're working and sending them money. So that's how a lot of people are surviving. And, and so a lot of people are just at home. Doing nothing so that, so this is a good time for the churches when they go out and visit and invite people, they're going to find people home all the time in every house. And, and that's why they say, look, there's a meeting come, there's a soccer game come, and they'll come. So this is a, a harvest mission field right for the harvest and not one American missionary that's there. Now, I keep saying that. I say there's no missionaries, zero missionaries. Well, in this last trip, I found one. I found one American missionary. You know where I found him? Hiding in the jungle. Hiding in the jungle. And that's where he is. Now, he, he's, he's not even an independent Baptist. He's a, he's a new tribe's missions missionary. So he's not even an independent Baptist. But, but he's an American hiding in the jungle, preaching, ministering to his tri tribal church. So at least he's preaching the gospel. 
And so, uh, but independent Baptists of our, of our kind of churches that are like-minded, zero, not one. And so I guess my question or my challenge is, how can I not go? How can I not go? If I can go and Americans cannot go, how can I not go to this country and go using stealth, going under the radar, going there and using and, and trying to exhort and encourage to say, Venezuelans, listen, get on fire for God. You know, the Bible calls that exhortation, the spiritual gift of exhortation. And we need to do that. We need to get them on fire. That's what happened in Mexico. It worked. It caught on in Mexico. It worked. So now in Venezuela, we can go there and say, listen, this is what happened in Mexico. Why don't you guys get on fire for God? And, and, and uh, let me tell you something. The, their spirits are up. They're not with some victim attitude. They're not, you know, being, being somebody, you know, that's, that's like a victim. They're, their spirits are up. They're, they're, they're thankful. They're appreciative of, of, of American missionaries and, and foreigners and visitors coming to help them. They know they're in a crisis. Listen, they got to sleep in the gas station. Sometimes a night or two to get gas. The line is 300 cars. I saw it. And, and I'm talking about I saw the wives take a sandwich to the husband. Another one, you know, uh, because they, they, have to, they can't lose their place in line. They got to keep their place in line. I saw where some men get in the line, spend two days in this long line. They finally get there, and they only get 40 liters of gas. They don't get the full tank, just 40 liters per person. They get it, and then they go home. Incredible. I'm talking about we, we had some bus captains because we use... Buses for this that around at the 11th hour. I mean, we're almost going to get done. But this is when we need help the most. I want to share this with you. If we do not reap the harvest, the sowing, the planting, the watering becomes meaningless. It's meaningless. That'd be silly for a farmer to plant, sow, cultivate, water, everything, grow the crops, harvest season comes, go to another field and, do, and start over. That'd be silly. See, we got to reap the harvest. We got to finish the job. It is an all-encompassing work. And the Lord, if you remember that parable, he pays them. Your, your labor and your, your, everything that you did, it was going to be unfinished. And that's no good. That's no good. The job has to get done. It's like in Mexico, they build houses. One man can build a house, one or two men, blocks and bricks, cement work. They can build a little house, maybe take them a month or two, but they can do it. Just one or two men working. But at the time of pouring that Pouring that, that roof, it's a, it's a cement roof with wooden beams and like a mesh type net. So, you know, and they put this, pour this cement and so forth. They got to have all the neighbors. They got to have every man they can get because it's got to be done all at the same time. It's got to be done just right. And it's got to every hand, every helping hand they need it. So the neighbors come because they know when it's their turn, they're going to have all the neighbors helping them. So they pour the roof. That's when they need the help the most. You can't have a house that doesn't have a roof and say, well, it's 90% finished. So living it only, enjoy it 90% of the time. You're not going to be able to live in a house like that. It's got to be finished. The job has to be finished. In like manner, the harvest has to be reaped. Otherwise, we're not finishing the job. So this is the project that we have. I have challenged myself. God has told me, get on the road, go to the United States again, and start traveling, raise this money. And I, of course, I have said to myself, Lord, but I've never done this and had these, you know, I mean, we raise love offerings, little, little love offerings and things, and go, go to Mexico, and I've worked jobs. I've, sometimes I say I'm going to get my tax return. Maybe I can have a, me, a good meeting in years past. You know, I'll finally get a good, uh, you know, check or something like that. But God has said, have not I sent thee? Have not I called thee? This is my work. This is my harvest mission field. God's more in. You get the stadium. I'll bring the bait. And together, we'll work di from home digitally. We'll work with, with advertising. We'll do a mass campaign to, to invite people, to, to bring people, to register people. And we'll have it all set up. And when we preach, you have to understand it's all day. It's, I mean, they'll hear the gospel three or four times, not just one time. Because we start in the morning, and then that's why we, we feed them and have a lunch so they can, so they can stay and hear, hear more preaching. And I, and I let them preach. I preach it myself, and then I tell the pastor, okay, now you preach and so forth. And, and, and they, they catch the vision, and they get the idea. The pastors said something in one of the me pastor's meetings. They gave me this hat. You saw the video, had a Chicago Bears hat, and they said, Brother Carlos, we saw you wearing that hat the whole time. We don't really know that symbol around here. We don't know what that is. But we bought with, and it's funny, I gave them, I gave them money for the budget. It said, with your money that you gave us, we bought you a small gift. It's just a token of, you know, of, of kindness. We bought you a small gift. 
and they bought me a cap, a hat, but it had the country, it had the country, you know, logo of Venezuela with a net over it. You know what that tells me? That they got the message. We need to cast the net over that country right now and, and, and go. Uh, it's a closed door, but I'm, I'm somebody that's a fisherman. My fishing boat, we got clearance. We can get in there and cast a big net. I wonder if, if maybe there would be some questions. Feel free to ask anything. You can raise your hand, and uh, we can talk about our ministry. It could be about Mexico, about Venezuela, or our ministry, my family, anything. If, if you have any questions, this would be a good time that maybe somebody could raise their hand or, or, or ask a question. Yes, sir. I, I, I raised my own monthly support, which right now my support could be is about 75% raised for my new goal that I have. Um, but I do, I do raise for what I call a project, or it's, it's the Venezuela ministry. This is close to $6,000. That covers my travel expenses, and basically it, and it covers like a stadium meeting and a couple other smaller spontaneous meetings that will have hundreds of people to. And I like to do things for the pastors to help their churches to be a blessing to them. Sometimes I give even the pastors a small love offering. I bought tires for a bus in this last trip. I bought tires. The tires had a wire, you know, so I, I, that was a church bus. We bought tires for it. It cost us about $700. And so different things, I like to raise money to go over there and spend it. Now, the tribal village pastors there, they had a meeting with me, about 20 pastors. These are, they had a translator. They don't talk Spanish. And they, they had a petition. They wrote it. They gave me a written petition. They said, Brother Carlos, we had American missionaries here that helped us and used to help us. But been six, seven years. They're gone. We're alone. If you can help us. And they had a list of needs. We're talking about guitars for just for mute or special music. You know, little, little, little electrical pianos. Just little things. Maybe a PA system. Maybe little things. They're translating the Bible into their dialect. They don't have a way to print that Bible. But... But they have, they have an app, and through a young man, through software, through a computer with an internet, you know, uh, connection, they are translating the Bible, and they have that app on their cell phones. So they just don't have a way to print it or anywhere to print it, but they have that, so they're working on that. And they said, Brother Carlos, this is what we're doing if we don't have anybody to help us. And I just tell them, pray. I'm like you. I'm by, I'm, I'm by faith. Just pray and communicate this to the churches and so forth. Yes, sir. So I raised by project to sponsor these meetings. My next location is picked out. I'm going with a Mexican missionary who's in Venezuela, and he's a Mexican pastor doing a great job. And so I have him picked out to go next. And we have like two more in line after that, but I got to take it one at a time. So my, my time frame is about two months. So a lot of people will say, Brother Carlos, so you're in the States then. You only go for two weeks, come back for two months. I did the math. I preached to more people in a, in a two-week stretch going twice than I did in a whole year, being staying inside of Mexico for a year, I preached to more people in, 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 a, in a shorter time because we were investing more money and doing bigger things, you see? So, so we're trying to have stewardship as well. We're trying to see how we can save time. We're trying to see how we can be more cost efficient and practice biblical stewardship to say, let's get more done, partner with the nationals. I can bring a missionary team. I mean, it's wonderful to have a mission trip and all these things we've had in Mexico. But, you know, those things cost more money. And to be quite honest, we don't need it. We don't need it. We need them. We need the nationals to, the churches to say, you know, get on fire for God. Any other questions? Anybody else? Maybe a, a different question. Yes, sir. First, I asked the pastors, find me the location, send me pictures. Through, through, you know, messages and so forth, through emails. Send me pictures. I want to pick out the location. It's got to have houses around. It's got to have places where people can sit or if we're going to rent chairs. So I tell the pastors, go take a picture. Because they don't know how, but I, I know how to have the meeting. So I send me the pictures, and then I'll pick one out. Go talk to the people. It might be a park district. How much does it cost to rent it? Okay, it costs $300 for one day. Tell them, tell them you know, sign the paper. I'll send you the $300. Uh, maybe we got to rent a thousand more chairs because it, not enough people fit, you know. So, so I, I talk the pastors through it. I tell them what to do. I send them the money to do it. And then once the date is on the calendar and the stadium is secure or the location, then we start doing through digital media. 
and, and, and we, we, we put in motion this registration that I talked about in the video. We put a register, people scan a little QR code like you would see a menu at a restaurant, people scan it, they can sign up, put everything, their information, and I get that in my home office in my spreadsheet and see, oh, you know, we can see how many people, all of this. So they start signing up. We motivate the churches. Now, we'll do something, you know, just food gets, gets them to come. Just that, just the fact there's going to be a meal. But I got to tell you something. Some of these promotions like playing soccer with the kids and everything, it makes them feel loved. Just giving them food, they come and say thank you for the food. You see? So, so it makes them feel loved. And that's a big thing. That's part of, part of the method to preach the gospel to them. It, it, the word is tender. It makes a tender heart. And it builds a relationship with them. So that's how I plan and prepare the meetings. Anybody else have another question? Yes, sir. In the jungles, you know, we, we're used to seeing like movies from, you know, like from the old west and all this stuff or the jungles, you know, but now they, there, are, there are military airplanes that fly into the jungle and they can take people, bring people in and out. So people are not so, you know, people, people have caught up to the times now. They, they dress with normal clothes, you know, so they have adapted and, and you know, so they can... They can come to the city, which would be like, I would call it like a county seat. That's where I stayed in the Amazon, the a county seats, which is the border of the Colombian River and, and the country of Colombia. And so it's like, a, it's like a port of entry. So all those jungle people come there, you know, and they can get things if they have little money and shop or something. Or, but that's where you can get internet, you know. I mean, you can't do it, get in the jungle, but, but they, down, they come there, they download it. They get cell phones, some of their old cell phones. Venezuela used to be a prosperous country, one of the most prosperous. So they have old laptops, old cell phones. And they buy, you know, there are families who are in America, by the way. I got them in my church, Venezuela people in, in Illinois. Their families send them money, and they can buy a cell phone, you see. So they, they, will, they will do stuff like that, and then they'll go back. They'll go back. Some of the cultural things, obviously, is the food. Uh, I'm talking about they offered me a spider to eat in a plate in, in that place. And uh, I just told them, sorry, no, I'm not going to eat that spider. They brought a cook out to, to explain to me how they cook it and how, you know, it's, it's really something, you know, very good and tasty and how they cooked it. And I said, I don't care how they cook it. Just, just tell them no very kindly, right? So I'll eat the fish, but not the spider. I'm talking about a big tarantula type looking spider. So, but there's cultural things like food and, uh, you know, their language. Obviously, they have different dialects, every village. Uh, speaks their own so it, you can't just translate it for the whole jungle every village has to we have to reach train develop and disciple to, to, to see you know what they need they need um, they need just even just one motorcycle they said brother carlos we got missionaries who they walk two days into the jungle if they had a motorcycle you know they could get around and get a lot of things they could coordinate more you know and, and just he can be the messenger to go tell them, hey everybody come to the big meeting you know and so Somebody walked for two days in the jungle, and I said, where do you sleep in the jungle, you know, to walk here? And they showed me a bag with their, like, uh, like a string bed. You know, they tie it from a tree, tie it to the other tree, and it's a string net looking, you know, and that's where they, that's where they sleep. That's their bed. And, and I said, what do you eat, you know? And he showed me some fruit and things. He said, oh, we got plenty of fruits out here and things like that or, you know, things like that. So, yes, there's culture shock, you know. I had to make sure I, we go to the county, county, uh, county seat location. Everybody drinks powder milk. You know, I got to have cereal. I got to have normal milk for my coffee. These things like that. <laughs> I had to make sure, you know, so we're, I'm, I'm glad we were able to get that stuff for me, right? So, but there is cultural things. Uh, and in the city, they're not tribal. They're not village. They're, they're city. They're professional city people. They have a, the Venezuela people have a Caribbean accent, so that's different. I have a Mexican accent, which I would consider to be standard Spanish, 
right? Just like you, you're American, so, you know, we're, you talk normal English, right? But if you go to, you know, Europe or something or England, they have an accent. Scotland, Ireland, they speak English, but they sound different. So that's the same thing. A Mexican sounds different in Venezuela because all, all those countries have a Caribbean Spanish, which means if you want to know what that accent is, they skip their R's and their S's. Totally skip it. They don't pronounce the R. They don't pronounce the S. That just completely makes a mess. <laughs> but, but anyway, that's, their, that's their, uh, their accent. And I pronounce, though, that they'll hear me and they give me a nickname. They call me the Mexican pastor. Because I have a Mexican accent. So at least that's a nice name. Anybody else? Any questions about the ministry, about Venezuela, about Mexico? Yes, sir. Not inside Venezuela. You can go as far as the Colombian River and watch. <laughs> watch from the river and wait. Wait for us. But cannot, you cannot go. You would, an American would be arrested. So it's absolutely no... Um, and uh, even I, if, I if, they, if they knew about me being really American also, and my origins and so forth, uh, you know, I, I would be questioned. I would be, you know, detained at the airport, and I would be totally, you know, just everything, you know, completely investigated and things like this and flagged in their system and everything. So I just go in there with my Mexican passport. I got Mexican driver license. I got this Mexican everything, you know, and said, okay, welcome, you know, just being a tourist or something. And uh, so that's how I get in. There is a six-month, there is a six-month time period, and that's the same in Mexico. So got plenty of time, but I, but the thing is, if I were to stay there and live there long, more long-term, even a month or two, I would... First of all, my accent gives it away, you know, that this is a foreigner, so he's getting sponsored from abroad. But it, it would, being in a house, even in Mexico, this, this, can, this became dangerous for us, being Mexican, and we blend in to the Mexican culture. But I would become a target for theft, for kidnapping. I would become a target. Who's, oh, that pastor's the one who sponsored, bought food for everybody. Let's kidnap him and get his church. Did you hear about what happened in Haiti, right, with these missionaries? They kidnap them, and they ask for money. So that happens in Mexico. And uh, just had a friend last week. He talked about, you know, they broke into his church, some cartel people. So it happens often. So it's safe for us to move around, you know, keep low a profile, and just, just get things done and leave. So that's safer for us. Uh, and that's just the best thing. You know, we're not going to go in there with, with all this fear. I mean, everybody's out and about doing just living a normal life. We don't have to be scared and afraid. But let's get things done. Let's get things done, and then we can just clear out. You know, any other questions about the ministry? So I'll just I'll just wrap it up with this. I'm flying to Mexico February the eighth. We'll be there for a month, helping my brother-in-law start a church in Mexico. So we're doing a church plant that's just next on the calendar. That's just something that came up that that we want to help and be a blessing. And um, Probably I'll go to Venezuela, maybe perhaps in the month of April. So I travel in the States to finish raising our support and get funds to be able to say, okay, let's go and let's have another stadium with that Mexican missionary. <laughs> then I have another city with a pastors that want to have. So we'll have evangelism and we'll have a pastor's training and teaching. And that's, that's the way that we work. If some of the children will see me, I brought leaves from the Amazon jungle. I only brought like four or five of them. These are original real leaves from the Amazon jungle. I disinfected them. I froze them. I boiled them. They're completely with no bacteria, no germs, nothing. I only have four or five of them. I got to get them in the car. So I'll give it to the kids who come see me at the display. Thank you so much. God bless you. She goes into Mexico. All right. We're going to be done.